Well, I'm pleased to welcome each of you here, and I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished guest speaker, whom I will introduce to you in, in just a minute or so. But I first want to let you know that this is the first of five lectures in a series that will take place over the next three semesters. This semester, spring semester, two lectures each semester on the oneness of God and the diversity of religions, and then we're going to conclude in the uh, fall of next year with a fifth lecture. And the series is inspired by an article that is now 50 years old. So one of the most influential uh, articles having to do with interfaith relations is an article by Abraham Joshua Heschel, Rabbi Heschel, called No Religion is an Island. And it was published in 1966. So this is the 50th anniversary. We'll be concluding it in a year after that in our series. But to commemorate the publication of that seminal article, we're doing this particular series. And we're having speakers from five traditions, and we start today with our Hindu speaker. In Heschel's article, I would say the principal thesis of the article is a, is a statement of belief, and that is he claimed that religious diversity, or he believed that religious diversity was the will of God, or is the will of God. Now Heschel was passionately committed to the oneness of God. He was a passionately committed Jew. And yet, he believed that a variety of religions reflected the divine and were valid pathways to the divine. And so for this series, I asked five speakers if they would speak about sources in their own traditions that challenge or support Heschel's thesis, that they would say what they think about this thesis. They're not going to do an analysis of that article or of Heschel, but just taking that one statement of belief out of this long article that, um, that diversity of religions is the will of God, or what we could say is seen as a divine good. I asked them if they would focus on um, sources in their own tradition, the challenge or uh, support that. They would explain what they think about this position and that they would expound upon whatever themes related to it that they would like to. And so the very first person that I asked was our distinguished guest today, Anathanan Rambachan, who hails from Trinidad, the descendant of Indians living in, in uh, Trinidad. And, but for the last 31 years, he's been a Minnesotan. Um, he's been at St. Olaf. We are really blessed to have him in this, in this state, living and working for all these years. He is indeed one of the greatest scholars of Hinduism and of interreligious dialogue in the world. He received his MA and his PhD degrees from the University of Leeds in England. He's been deeply involved in interreligious dialogue for several decades now, especially Hindu-Christian dialogue. He's lectured in many countries. He's an active participant, participant in the dialogue program of the World Council of Churches and in consultations of the Pontifical uh, Council for Interreligious Dialogue at the Vatican. At the invitation of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury Professor uh, Ramachan delivered the distinguished Lambeth Lang uh, Lecture at Lambeth Palace in London. He's the author of many books, a few of which are over there, right? And uh, the most recent one um, is the one standing up on the left of the three that are standing up, and it's a Hindu theology of liberation, and it's a marvelous work of real spiritual brilliance, and yet it's very accessible. So I strongly recommend that you uh, consider a purchase or purchasing that book. 
and look at the other ones and possibly purchase some other ones there. There's a wealth of enlightenment and insight in these books. He's also the author of numerous articles published in both scholarly and popular journals. The British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, has transmitted 25 of his lectures around the world. Twice he has delivered the invocation at the White House for the Hindu festival of Diwali there. It is indeed a great privilege and a real joy to welcome you here again to St. John's. So greetings and uh, namaste to all of you. And I want, of course, to begin by thanking John, I'm honored to call him a friend for his gracious words of, and generous words of uh, welcome. I'm happy to be in this uh, room with uh, so many of you and uh, especially with so many students. Uh, I recognize some of you from your visit to our temple uh, not, not long ago. I want and I asked John's permission if I would start with a, a Sanskrit uh, invocation. And uh, this is an invocation that comes from the Veda, the most ancient uh, Hindu uh, text, recited whenever people started a dialogue or a conversation. So it's an invocation of blessing for our conversation or a dialogue together. I will recite in Sanskrit and then I will just briefly translate the meaning for you. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvina Vadhitamastu Mavid Vishavahe Om Shanti Shanti, shanti. So the meaning is, uh, may God nourish and sustain us. May our conversation be full of energy and light, and uh, may we not despise each other. <laughs> So John has uh, chosen a very beautiful um, title for this uh, series, The Oneness of God and the Diversity of Religions. But it's also a very difficult and uh, a challenging uh, question. And I don't come here with all the answers to the riddle of the oneness of God and the diversity of, of religions. I am very wary of offering uh, simplistic or canned formula, formulas to such a complex theological question. But what I can promise is to share something of the Hindu tradition and how Hindus have thought about this uh, matter, some of the central insights of the Hindu tradition around uh, uh, John's uh, question. I will focus my presentation on, for, to give it structure, on a text that I asked um, to be distributed. And I think you sh should have one, or you should be very close uh, to a text. I'll come to that text in, in a moment. But I thought it would be a good place for me to sort of uh, hang the major insights and points that I want to make uh, this afternoon. But uh, just a few general remarks about uh, the tradition, the Hindu tradition. First of all, you know, like other traditions, <laughs> it's, a, it's one of great intra-diversity. Uh, and it's important um, to say that in so many ways, the Hindu tradition is like a family of religious uh, traditions rather than a, rather than a single homogenized or uniform uh, tradition. The name Hindu, as many of you might know, is a geographical term. It identifies 
a river, uh, the Indus River, which is also called the Sindhu or the Hindu River. And uh, those people who lived on the territory drained by that river were called the Hindus. But it didn't, wasn't used initially to identify you know, religious practice or religious uh, teaching. It's uh, just identified them geographically in relation to the river. And so the word Hindu um, embraces tremendous uh, diversity of, of teachings and, uh, and practice. And it's always important to remind ourselves uh, of, of that. The term Hinduism was actually only used uh, for the first time by uh, missionaries uh, in India. They sought, they sought to homogenize the tradition in order to engage it. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> they also were in the process of creating <laughs> a, a homogeneous uh, tradition for uh, specific purposes. The diversity also means that this is a, a very decentralized uh, tradition. The Hindu tradition does not have the central kinds of institutions that many other traditions uh, are noted uh, for. There is no single authoritative voice that speaks for all uh, Hindus. So uh, it doesn't have a historical founder uh, like uh, other traditions, you know, one person that we can point to who was or is a seminal source of the of the teaching. It is a. I think it's fair to describe it as a as a knowledge based tradition, as a wisdom based uh, tradition. The most ancient uh, Hindu text, the one from which I have uh, sh shared two verses with you are the Vedas. And the Veda in Sanskrit simply means knowledge. So it's a text that is, it's a tradition that is centered around certain claims about the nature of reality, about the human problem and its, and its resolution. And so I want to uh, uh, turn to, the, start with the text that I shared uh, with you, which comes from the Rig Veda which is the most ancient of the, of the Vedas. This scholarly opinions about its dating are all over the place, but I think conservatively, at least 2000 years BC, BCE, if not uh, earlier. So this is a text about speaking, about speech. And these are two verses from this uh, Rig Veda hymn. Speech hath been measured out in four divisions. The wise who have understanding know them. Three kept in close concealment cause no motion. Of speech, men only speak the fourth division. They call him Indra, Mitra, Varuna, Agni. And he is the noble-winged Garutman, the one being, in Sanskrit, ekam sat, the one being. The wise speak of, in many ways, they call it Agni, Yama, Matarishwan. So as we look at this text, which is probably, I would say it's the most often cited text by Hindu scholars in dialogical context and perhaps the most misused text <laughs> as, as well. The first verse provides the context with an insight about the nature of, of human speech. And it does so by presenting the, to the totality of speech as consisting of four quarters. The division of things into four is quite a common strategy in the, in the Vedas. Human speech comprises only a quarter of the total potentiality or possibilities of speech. And in describing three quarters of the speech as kept in close concealment, as you see in the text, causing no motion, perhaps the verses suggest powerfully the language of silence. 
as a mode of, of speech or the ultimate inexpressibility of the one being, the ekam sat, that is referred to, the, referred to in the verse 46, this, the second uh, verse. But we'll get more into the text. It, it seems to suggest that articulated speech does not exhaust our modes of communication, especially in relation to the one being, the ekam sat. What is, I ask myself, what is the possible context for a verse like this? Why this particular verse in this ancient uh, text? What, what may we assume or presume for this text? And given the age of the Rig Veda, which I says about 2300 BCE, I imagine that the text is addressing a religious situation, or perhaps intra-religious situation, if I would use that term, in which different names used for God, or for the one being, the Ekam Sat, were perceived as referring to different realities. It is also possible that claims were being, were being made for the superiority of one name and, and form over other names and forms and communities saw themselves as religious rivals. So by calling attention as the, the, the rishi, we speak of the, the author as the, as the rishi, the seer, by calling attention to the ekam sat, the one being, and describing those who use different names as wise. That's important. The wise speak of this one being in many ways, I'll come back to that point. The text is providing us with one way of interpreting religious diversity, the diversity of names and ways of speaking. In other words, the God of the other is not false. It's not non-existent. It's not subordinate to one's own, but a different way of naming and imagining this ekam sat, this one, one being. And we choose from the many names and images of the one. Now I admit, uh, to problematize this a bit, that it may be problematic when a text like this is lifted from the context in which it was articulated, the Indian religious context where Perhaps there was a significant sharing of beliefs and practices and applied uncritically to a new interreligious reality like our own, with perhaps more contrasting worldviews. But there was a lot of diversity within the Indian context as well. And I think such applications, I admit, will require deeper dialogical engagement. And, and the text certainly invites such consideration across religious traditions. So one question that arises for me from this text is what common ground does it take for us to say that our traditions are oriented towards the one, the one being, the ekam, the ekam sat. There is a very um, interesting work by the Christian um, theologian, I'm sure many of you uh, might have even read it, Miroslav Wolf, who wrote, uh, published a book uh, called Allah, A Christian Inquiry. And in this book, uh, Wolf was engaging this question. If I look, he asked himself, if I look at the Christian understanding of God and the Islamic understanding of Allah, can I say that both of these traditions are indeed speaking of the one being? What does it take to say that the God of the Christian tradition and the God of Islam is the one, is the one God? Clearly, that's, that's the kind of question that can be probed in relation to the Hindu uh, tradition as well, but I think it comes out of this, uh, this text. 
Surely, when we think about religious diversity, one of the fundamental insights of this text for me is the powerful reminder that in relation to the one, to the one God, our language is always limited and, and inadequate. We speak only a fort of the totality of, of speech. The one being is always more than we can define, more than we can describe, more than we can comprehend with our finite minds and images. And no word, no representation, no symbol is complete or adequate in relation to that one. There are so many uh, Hindu texts that, that return us to this point, and I just give a few examples uh, here. Uh, one from the Taitiri Upanishad, that, that is the one being. That from which the mind and all words return, having failed to reach. And Kena Upanishad, puts it in interesting ways. It is known to him to whom it is unknown. He does not know it to whom it is known. It is unknown to those who know well, unknown to those who do not know. Those who, whenever we claim to know it well, we don't know. Um, and then Kena Upanishad again, that which is not uttered by speech, that by which speech is expressed, that which makes speech possible. Know that alone to be the infinite, not this which is being worshipped. That last line is quite interesting because this is, refers to a finite object that is seen. This is not the infinite. The infinite is that which can't be expressed in any uh, words. I put two quotes. Let's so add something from two well-known Christian theologians in relation to the, what I just cited from the Upanishads, Gregory. God is incapable of being grasped by any term or any idea or any other conception. And of course, Aquinas, everything is noble according to its actuality. But God whose being is infinite is infinitely noble. No, now no created intellect can know God infinitely. Hence, it is impossible that any created intellect should comprehend uh, God, I think there's a meeting here between the Upanishads and uh, the insights of uh, these great uh, theologians. The implication is that we can only speak of the one being with humility in an interreligious context. And not only humility, but with openness to learning from and being enriched by the ways people of other traditions speak of this, of this one. Because if, no, if my mode of speaking does not exhaust its depths and its truth, how could I be anything other than humble and attentive to what the other uh, says? One name is never enough. We have in the Hindu, I just put this, we have in the Hindu tradition a certain uh, genre of writing, which is, you know, we have many compositions. Each one is a thousand names. So for God of Shiva, the thousand names of Shiva. These are just some <laughs> of the thousand names. God is Vishnu, a thousand names. God is Divine Mother. Sahasrana is called as the Sahasranam genre, the thousand name mode of speaking. So Shiva is Hara, Mrida, Rudra, Pushkara, Push, Pushpalochana, Artigamya. And each word, of course, says something about the nature of, of, the, of the divine. So when we employ our limited language, as the text says, a fraction of the total potentiality of expression to speak of the one being, our language, as the text says, Bahuda, language will be manifold. Our language will be diverse, not because the one being, not, not because there are many one beings, but because of the nature of, the finite, finite nature of, of language. So 
the key text in these two verses is the penultimate line. The one being the wise speak of in many, the word in Sanskrit is bahuda, bahuda vadanti. With our finite words, we struggle to describe that which is always linguistically or symbolically elusive uh, for us. We use many names, as the text suggests. Indra, Mitra, Varuna, Agni, Yama, Matarishwan. Not because the gods are many, but because of our own human limits. The limits of our own language uh, systems. But this comes to the first part of the title of the series. Acknowledging the diversity of ways of speaking, the text is unambiguous in its assertion about the oneness, ekam sat, that one being. It is the one that is spoken of in diverse ways. So those who name the one as Indra, those who name the one as Agni, those who name the one as Varuna, are in reality addressing, not addressing themselves to different beings, but to the one true being, the one Ekam uh, Sat. Each is a name for the one. The text, as I read it, is a rejection of the literal existence of many gods and the proclamation of the truth of the one, the Ekam Sat. But at the same time, this one is named in many ways, imagined differently within the diverse streams of the tradition. It is true, Hindus like Gandhi and, and others have used this text and extended it beyond the boundaries of the Hindu tradition to speak of uh, God in the Jewish, Christian, Muslim uh, tradition as well, one of Gandhi's favorites favorite hymns that he would have everyone recite on evenings is Ishwara Allah Tero Naam. Your name is Ishwara, and he added, and Allah, which the Veda text does not speak, but he added, in the spirit of the text, he added the name, names of God from the Muslim tradition. Now, one of the interesting things about this, this text as you look at it, is that there are many particular and personal names for God. Mitra, Varuna, Agni, Yama, Matarishwan. But when the, the, the Rishi, the sage, wants to speak about the oneness, he calls it Sat, Ekam Sat. The one being, he calls it being, Sat. Sat also means, can be translated as reality, the absolute. So he doesn't use a particular name, but he uses a term, the one being, that can include many, that can be called by many names. So he goes for a much larger category of reality, Ekam Sat, and then you, know, you have all of the, the, the personal names. So I think that's, that's an important uh, insight of the text because in Sanskrit, the term sat, an ekam sat, can in fact be used for both theistic as well as non-theistic descriptions of the, of the ultimate reality. It, 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 embr it can embrace both the theistic and the, the non-theistic. Uh, I don't use the word impersonal, personal, theistic and non non-theistic uh, ideas. So this insight enables us to think of persons of other traditions not as strangers with alien or false or rival deities, but as belonging to the larger community as fellow beings whose God is also our, our God. And for Gandhi, this was transformative. I have a quote from him. I believe in the absolute oneness of God and therefore of humanity. This is what he drew from it. 
What though we have many bodies, we have but one soul. The rays of the sun are many through refraction. So he develops a metaphor, but they have the same source. I cannot therefore detach myself from the wickedest soul, nor may I be denied identity with the most uh, virtuous. And in keeping with the inspiration of Herschel, I, um, I included something from him. There's no inside more disclosing. God is one, humanity is one. So how the two get connected um, becomes uh, very uh, important. And, Hindus have drawn that implication from a text like, like this one. Now, I admit, as I said, that some Hindus <laughs> have used the text in ways that I don't quite agree with. And uh, one of those ways is to reduce differences to merely semantic differences. And I, I think that's reading too much into this uh, text. So I would say that although the, the text is acknowledging the limits of language and the multiple ways in which we might speak of this one being, the Ekam Sat. The text does not, as is all too commonly assumed, insist that religious differences are insignificant. I do not think that there is a minimization here of religious differences or the implication that you know, all traditions are identical. Instead of underplaying differences, we may read from the text the necessity to be attentive to difference. And the reason why I say that is that the one being, the penultimate line again, the one being, and it's an important term there, vipraha, the wise speak of differently. The wise, so who is speaking differently? The text does not chooses intentionally to define those who speak differently as wise people. Vipraha in Sanskrit. It's not the ignorant who is speaking differently, but wise people are speaking differently. And if wise speak, people speak differently, then you should, you should listen. You should lif, listen to the different ways in which they are speaking, because those differences can be uh, instructive. In other words, Theological diversity, uh, diversity of religions is not dismissed here as the consequence of ignorance or vidya. There is something significant by acknowledging that the vipraha, the wise, speak differently. I, I, I see the text as inviting a respectful and inquiring response to religious diversity, asking us to be attentive rather than hastily denouncing the speech of the other as undeserving of serious and, uh, consideration or, or contemplation. It is not as if, you know, of course, I've already spoken of the fact that we can't know everything, but it is not as if when we know we will speak the same. <laughs> we may continue to speak uh, differently. Wisdom must not be identified with our way of speaking. And we should not assume that wise people always speak identically or that wisdom is manifested only when there is consensus. I think there is a lifting up here of the significance of, of difference. When, when we encounter the religious traditions of others, it is better for us to assume that they endure because they speak wisely and meaningfully to the human predicament and in ways that we could be enriched and learn by, from these uh, differences. But we will not learn unless our disposition to these traditions is humble and uh, unless we cease condemning that which is different merely for the fact that it is, it is uh, different. I think, you know, for me, some of my deepest uh, religious learning uh, learnings have taken place through this encounter with difference, through the wise voices of other traditions who speak uh, differently from uh, my way of, of speaking. And at the same time, all we, I'm not saying, or nor would I read into the text, that all ways of speaking are equally. <laughs> true or valid to the one 
being. I don't think the, the Rig Veda text should be read as affirming the equal worth of all ways of, of speaking. One would have to stretch the text. Although the text identifies the one being as the common referent of diverse religious speech, it, is not, it doesn't imply that each way of speaking is equally true to its referent. Why? Well, today we, we are much more aware across religious traditions of ways of speaking, ways of naming this one that uh, invoke to justify hate, to justify violence. And so the naming of the one in ways that instigate divisiveness and violence and hate certainly can't be as true. It's in my, in my location as those that arouse compassion, love for the other, generosity. It is naive and, and dangerous, I would say today, to attribute equal validity to all ways of religious um, speaking. I mean, even Gandhi, a great advocate of, of this position, found it impossible to grant equal status to all religious voices, even within the Hindu um, tradition. He had to stake out a normative space from, it, from where he would, would speak, for example, in his, in his attitude to violence or in relation to uh, untouchability on the Indian uh, subcontinent. So while, while the text is affirming the significance of difference, I think it is not saying that mere difference is wisdom. We need, it, it, it does not excuse the need for discernment when we are thinking and engaging um, people of other religious uh, traditions or other traditions. My time is moving much quicker than I anticipated, so I, I want to touch on one interesting, I mean the term is not used in this verse, but I think it has come out of this way of, of thinking. And perhaps, you know, the one Hindu doctrine or teaching that perhaps exemplifies in practice more than anything else the, the wisdom of this verse is the doctrine of the Ishtadeva or choosing God, the God of one's choice. Um, so again, it's a very special Hindu teaching, the Ishtadeva. Again, it implies a context of religious diversity, where many names, many forms of the one are available. And from these, you choose, you have to choose. And uh, the choices might, within the Hindu tradition, I'm speaking about choices like Shiva or Vishnu or, or the Divine Mother, uh, Shakta. And it is quite possible that, again, these, and I think in reality, these Ishtadevas were perceived as different and competing deities and their worshippers as rival communities. And there are many myths connected with figures like Vishnu and Shiva, which would affirm their superiority over each other or, or seek to arrange the deities in some kind of hierarchical order with one above the other. It's very difficult to trace the history of the Ishtadeva idea. But again, I think the, the, the doctrine as it obtains uh, today is precisely a response to such exclusive and sectarian claims and rivalries about which, about the true the true uh, God. So as these communities interacted and engaged each other, as religious traditions are doing um, today, I, I think there was a movement from seeing the other deity as a rival to one's uh, own or as a false deity or as a hierarchically subordinated deity and seeing that deity as one form of the one, a form of the one, 
that, that you choose. In some ways, I would say that uh, the project of someone like Mir Miroslav well, if I could cast it in these terms, he's asking, is it possible to see Allah as an Ishta Deva of the one? You know, named as Allah, chosen you know, by a particular religious uh, community, but at the same time identical to the one being of other religious traditions. What is special about the, the Ishta Deva uh, teaching is that the choice is not exclusive. Since you are doing so with an awareness that others have chosen differently and that all choices relate to the one. But this absence of exclusivity does not imply a weak and lukewarm choice. It's a commitment. Ishta Deva is also about making a commitment intellectually and emotionally to the one that you have chosen, knowing that others have chosen uh, differently. So your choice, you relate your choice to the choice of others. And uh, you make a commitment, but with a certain openness um, to the fact that one has, another has chosen differently. I think the doctrine also reminds us that there is an element of cultural creation in our respective ideas about, about God. There is truth that God chooses us, but we also choose uh, in, in many ways. And, uh, and this is an, uh, at least an acknowledgment of this, uh, of this fact, this uh, fact of uh, choice. I wanted to, to draw your attention to um, it's a very well-known um, event in, in the life of Krishna. It's uh, called the Ras Leela dance, the dance of joy. And um, in this dance, as you can see, uh, Krishna, in his, the story of Krishna's life, at the end of the day, you know, he'd come out into the into the open ground and uh, the gopis, uh, the young women will come out also to join him in this, in this dance. But uh, he multiplied himself and everyone who danced, taught, knew that they were, they were dancing with God. But there's a but to the story. <laughs> if any of the gopis thought while the dance was going on that they alone danced with him, he disappeared. They were left without a dancing partner. As long as they knew that they were dancing with him and others were dancing with him, he was with them, but they lost him when they made an attempt to own him exclusively. God can't be possessed <laughs> or claimed. Ishtadeva, I wanted to show you uh, in the architecture of our temple in, in Minnesota. I mean, what we have evolving in the outside of India is a really interesting uh, temple architecture, which you will not see, generally see in this way in the, the traditional temples of India. But as you can see from this picture, this is the worship space of the Hindu temple in, in Maple Grove, and within the the shrine area, there are many shrines. And each one houses a particular form of God, a particular name of, of God. This is uh, uh, the, the one of the centers, it's a form of God as Vishnu. Another shot of the temple. Interesting, mm -hmm. also within the temple are the Jains. The Jain, um, the, the icons of the Jain, which is a largely a non-theistic <laughs> um, tradition, but they also have a space in the, in the general uh, worship area. And, uh, and pragmatically what happens there when Hindus congregate is that they will go to the shrine of their Ishtadevas. 
the form of God that they have chosen, knowing that their neighbors go to another, another shrine. What makes it work, as I said, is that they have chosen a particular expression of the one being that the other has also uh, chosen. So there's, there, there's the absence of a sense of a rival deity or rival God. Even, you know, these are very different kinds of um, icons in the temple. As you can see, they are, the, 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 the sculpture has more greater folk character or even tribal uh, characteristics. Uh, these is, this is also one shrine. Um, these are the deities from the area of Orissa. They are forms of Krishna, unlike the other um, icons, they are, they are made out of wood, so they are changed, but you can see the features uh, representing a different um, cultural uh, stream. Let me conclude a little bit earlier than I anticipated, but because of time, it's a famous, with a famous text from the Bhagavad Gita, which also speaks to the topic that uh, John gave to us, which is from the fourth chapter. Howsoever people approach me, so do I accept them. For the paths people take from every side are mine. Very famous um, text from the, the Bhagavad Gita. It's, it's, a, it's, it's affirms the absolute freedom of the divine to make God's self known to human beings in ways that are meaningful to a diversity of human uh, natures. God responds appropriately to the yearning of the human being wherever and in whatever diverse form that longing may be expressed. Many great teachers have made this text central to the theology of diversity. Uh, Ramakrishna, the, the guru of Swami Vivekananda, who was the first great teacher to come to the West, often cited this teaching and uh, used his own <laughs> homely example <laughs> to speak about it. He was Bengali, so Bengali is like fish, <laughs> so his, his example comes from a fish dish, a fish pilaf, the mother, and, and he worshiped God as mother, and he says, you know, God is like the mother. Does not give fish pilaf to all of her children because some of them don't like it. <laughs> so she has to make different dishes, all can't digest this, so she prepares uh, sometimes uh, fish soup for some of them who, uh, uh, would prefer such a addition. It has led to the development of a theology of, of what is called a theology of, of bhavas uh, in the Hindu tradition. Uh, I just quickly mentioned um, these. So this is one mode of relating to the divine. It's called shanta bhava. There's some human beings who are contemplative, inherently contemplative, and they seek God. Uh, through the disciplines of contemplation, or what is called shanta bhava. And then the servant relationship. They're not exclusive, but one regards oneself primarily as a servant of the divine, and one's spirituality has very active expressions. Whereas another uh, honors the, the divine in meditative uh, practice. I give Gandhi as an example. That's how he spoke of himself. Uh, friend, Sakya Bhava. Each one, Bhava means a dis disposition. A primary orientation is called a Bhava. God is as friend, and this is being the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna taught of Krishna primarily as, as friend. And uh, this is uh, interesting also, but it's very special to those traditions that have doctrines of incarnation. God is child. Vatsalya Bhava, this is a picture of Krishna and his, and his mother. It's a, it's a, it depicts a very famous story in the tradition of Krishna where his friends said to him, the, the children were playing outside of the home and 
the friends reported that Krishna had put some dirt into his mouth. <laughs> and so his mother calls him and says, you know, let me see, your friend said that you ate dirt while you were playing. Let me see what you have in your mouth. <laughs> so moms will understand very well. And um, then she forces open his mouth because he doesn't want to show her that what he has in his mouth. She forces open his mouth and in the text, when she looks into the mouth of her child, she sees the entire universe. She doesn't see a grain of sand, but she sees the world, uh, universes, and describes all of reality within the divine uh, child. But this attitude of revering God as a child, you, you will see it in Hindu temples on those festival days that celebrate the birth of Krishna or the birth of, of, of Ram, where you know, the icons would be put in cribs and they would be uh, rocked and um, toys will be offered um, as part of the worship uh, procedure. And then, of course, Madhura Bhava, God as lover, God as the beloved, uh, the most regarded as the most intense of the Bhavas, um, Radha uh, and Krishna. Uh, the famous poet, uh, singer, Mira, saw Krishna as divine lover, divine uh, be beloved figure. So these are different rasas, but the variety of rasas is speaking to a diversity of humanity within, the hu within human nature, and God allows for the diversity of uh, relationships that are exemplified um, there. So quickly, I wouldn't elaborate these points. Um, this is the value of this text for me. Uh, it makes a great difference to me to think that you and I, we can honor our diversity, but that we are, our diversity relates us to the Ekam Sat, the one being is for me a transformative insight because it enlarges, immediately enlarges community uh, a community without boundaries, humility. And to, to end with a quote again from Abraham Heschel, what is an idol, he asks. Any God who is mine, but not yours. Any God concerned with me, but not with you, is an idol. Any God who is not, I would say, any God who is not the Ekam Sat, that one being is, is an idol. So thank you very much. I will uh, stop there.